Okay. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I'll let everybody take a moment to get their seats. I don't have my gavel today, so. All right. Good afternoon, and thank you for being here today. My name is Stephanie Russo-Baca. I'm the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District Board of Directors Chairwoman. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's great to see so many New Mexicans gathered in one place to revisit the history of the Middle Rio Grande Valley and be a part of the discussion about our future. All of you are special guests to the MRGCD, and we are so grateful to have many elected officials, dignitaries, and governmental organizations here with us. Please do take a moment to review our slideshow that features these guests. March 12th of this year marked 100 years since the New Mexico State Legislature passed the first Conservancy Act which provided the initial legal framework for the formation of conservancy districts throughout the state. Two years later, in 1925, the MRGCD was formed to address specific challenges along the Rio Grande by providing the Middle Valley with river flood control, groundwater management, and irrigation water. Today, the MRGCD provides services spanning 1,200 miles to the six Middle Rio Grande Pueblos, over 100,000 parcels of land, 60,000 acres of irrigated land, 11,000 irrigators, and 30,000 acres of bosque in Sandoval, Bernalillo, Valencia, and Socorro counties. Today, the Middle Valley faces significant water resource challenges due to the natural factors like high temperatures and lack of rain. Coupled with the inability to store water due to the age infrastructure. That is why it is so important that we in this room, along with our colleagues and communities, continue to stay engaged in the discussion around water in New Mexico. The staff and board of directors at the MRGCD will always strive to help keep the Middle Rio Grande Valley a sustainable place for farmers to irrigate and a safe place for residents and wildlife to call home. And as we come together today and acknowledge the challenges of the past, we must also come together to realize the challenges we face in our future. Here to help us recall some of the important history that changed the Middle Rio Grande Valley forever and lead us to think about our shared future is my friend John Fleck. John Fleck, a former science journalist, is writer in residence at the Utten Center, housed at the University of New Mexico School of Law, and professor of practice in water policy and governance in the University of New Mexico Department of Economics. The former director of the UNM Water Resources Program, he is the author of Water is for Fighting, Over, and Other Myths About Water in the West, and co-author with Eric Kuhn of Science Be Damned, How Ignoring Inconvenient Science Drained the Colorado River. He's working with Bob Behrens on a new book, Ribbons Green, The Rio Grande and the Making of a Modern American City, to be published by the University of New Mexico Press. Please welcome Mr. John Fleck. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Stephanie. And, and a, a big thank you to all of you um, in the audience. It's, a, um, it's an honor and a privilege to have the chance to share with you um, some of the history that is so important to me and so important to us as a community um, as we think about the Conservancy Act, the Rio Grande, our history <clears throat> and our future. Um, when Bob Behrens and I set out to write the book Ribbons of Green, which were in the final stages of finishing, um, what we set out to do was 
tell the story of the history of Albuquerque's relationship with its river. <clears throat> and when we pitched the book to the University of New Mexico Press, we very explicitly said, look, we're not writing a history of the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District. Um, but we found inevitably that we couldn't tell the history of Albuquerque's relationship, of our community's relationship with this river without understanding the history of the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District. Um, we tend to think in our modern terms of, as government agencies as a fixed thing that exists out in the world. Um, and it's really interesting and useful, I think, to step back and look at the formation of the rules that we wrote to change our relationship with this river, which led to the creation of a number of government agencies that do work to help us manage this river. Um, they are agents, they are our agents, right? They're not the separate thing. They're things we created to do work on our own behalf. And when Bob and I set out um, to, to work on this book, it was based on a, a really important premise that if you want to understand communities, and this is at the heart of all the work I've done over the last 10 years writing books, if you want to understand a community, you can always start with its water. Communities of people come together to act collectively, to carry out the business of being a community. And one of the first problems you have to solve as a community at any scale, at a little village, at a bigger town, at a city, at a metropolitan region, is how do we make peace with all these challenges of water? How do we get clean water to our homes and to irrigate the crops that, that we, um, that, that are the food that we'll eat? How do we get rid of our waste? How do we keep the river in a way that doesn't flood where we've decided we want to put our homes? And, and if you look at this valley, this long strip of more than 100 miles of Rio Grande Valley that spans the middle Rio Grande Conservancy District landscape, it, it flows through a whole bunch of different communities, right? Um, we have pueblos, we have villages, we have municipal cities, um, we have county governments. Um, and we have one government agency threaded through the entire thing, which is the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District, which runs from Cochiti on the north to Elephant Butte, almost to Elephant Butte Reservoir on the south. And so to understand our relationship with this river, you have to understand this government agency. Um, and you have to understand uh, how it came to be. Um, so, I would like to start with the modern. So look at that picture in the top right. Took that, I don't know, last week, week and a half ago, standing in the bed of the Rio Grande, looking north, um, looking upstream. It's taken just about a mile, three quarters of a mile or a mile downstream from here. Looking up at downtown Albuquerque. Um, and the picture on the bottom right is roughly the same location. That's taken uh, in 1912. Um, that was the magnificent newly built Borellis Bridge, the first steel girder bridge. Bridges across rivers turned out to be really, really important, uh, like who builds the bridges and why. Um, the Rio Grande, th there's this really interesting word that you see over and over again in the literature, in the discussions, in the newspaper articles, and the government documents at the time. The Rio Grande was a menace, right? And so if we... Um, like, like we're here at the Hispanic Cultural Center, uh, favorite meetup spot for bike rides with my friends. I'll ride down from the heights, meet in the parking lot. Friends will ride up from the valley, and we'll get on the, the levee that you can see right behind us, and we'll ride down the levee road, favorite bike ride. And the river is, is to our right. It's to the west, right? The river is a thing that's over there. Um, but if you look at the old maps, and there's a great one um, uh, out, out in the lobby, the place where we are this was the river, right? And the river was not like fixed in a single place. We had built a city across a floodplain and um, rivers do what they want to do, right? Rivers want to wander across floodplains. Um, and so as we were building a city in the early 20th century, 
we were putting it where the river wanted to be. Like, we could not have had a bunch of buildings here. There weren't buildings here because the river would come up here in high spring flows. Um, at the time of the Conservancy District's formation um, in the 1920s, um, this was a community and a valley that was fundamentally changing in a bunch of really important ways. And the river and the changes in the river were at the heart of it. So um, we have a long history here. Humans have been in this valley since time immemorial. We have Pueblo communities up and down the valley who still live where they lived and have lived for time immemorial. Generally speaking, on the best high ground, <laughs> they, they, they built in good places, and they tend to have, have stayed in those good places. Um, we had um, Spanish villages up and down the valley, which had followed the locations of the um, Pueblos and existed in tension over land and sovereignty, and I'll, and I'll talk some about that. Um, we had um, a sheep economy, the core of Albuquerque's sheep economy, the core of Albuquerque's economy in the 1800s was sheep. You would have um, villages, people living on the valley floor, um, uh, both uh, Native American Pueblo people, Hispanic people, and then later the early Anglo immigrants. The, the sheep would graze up on the uh, mesas and off on the landscape well beyond. Um, uh, uh, farming on the valley floor was largely ancillary to that sheep economy. People farmed to grow food to eat for their own communities. There was very little in the way of export. You couldn't export, um, really. The, the sheep were an export because they could walk to market, right? They would herd the sheep off to the big markets, the mines in Mexico or the mines in California. Um, uh, but something really important happened in 1880 um, when the railroad arrived, and the railroad changed everything. The arrival of the railroad changed everything. It changed the river, changed the structure of our community's economies, changed our relationship with um, the, the greater outside world. Um, and so what I wanna tell you is the story of that change and how this community came together sometimes in collaboration, sometimes in conflict, to respond to that change in a way that has made possible um, the the community that we are today. Um, and I want to tell you the story um, uh, uh, with a story, I'm a storyteller, right? I'm a former journalist, right? So three, three people. And I, and I don't want you to think these are the most important leaders. This was a broad series of societal forces, but these are three people who can help us understand um, that story. Three communities. Two communities very much rooted in the past, one very much rooted in the future. Um, Max Gutierrez, uh, political leader, uh, farmer, stockman, county commissioner, um, leader of the movement to um, create the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District. Aldo Leopold, famous conservationist, began his career as a forester here in Albuquerque. Um, and was part of the group from the Chamber of Commerce, the largely Anglo downtown business organization that led the fight to bring drainage and flood control to the valley. And Pablo Abeta, um, uh, well-known former governor of Isleta Pueblo, leader of Isleta um, Pueblo. So you have sort of two cultures very much rooted in, in, a, in a past, one culture moving toward the future, and all three interacting in really interesting and complicated ways. So you had the, the Pueblos, really very important struggle to retain cultural and political and, and legal sovereignty over their own land and their water and lifeways. You had a farming community represented by Max um, who uh, um, were very much seeing their way of life go away, partly because of the behavior of the river itself. Um, and you had a city we were trying to build a city in a swamp. Right? It wasn't going to work. Um, so let's uh, talk about Albuquerque in the 1920s. Um, this is the Springer Storage and Moving Company, still pulling their wagons by horse. Springer actually, at one point, owned the land on which we're sitting. I'm pretty, we're pretty sure. Um, uh, 
New Mexico only um, became a state in 1912, something that was very much delayed relative to some of our neighbors by, you know, deep, deeply embedded entrenched national racism about um, the, the bringing the Hispanic residents of the state, um, you know, into American nationhood. Long and really difficult history of the struggle for statehood here because of, of that problem. Um, women's suffrage uh, in, um, uh, yeah, women's suffrage um, in, in 1919, um, the, the Pueblo people did not have the vote until much later. That's a complicated story and I'm gonna get to that. Um, uh, the Reclamation Act had passed in 1902, which was an effort by the federal government to begin to bring federal assistance to communities trying to do the sort of stuff we thought we might wanna do here. Um, uh, and we'd seen reclamation coming in other places in the West. People here looked to Phoenix, which had a big reclamation project, dams and canals to irrigate landscape. The Elephant Butte Irrigation um, District was being formed um, downstream. Um, and so we, it was this moment of change. Um, the arrival of the railroad um, was a dramatic piece of that change, right? Um, it immediately, in an instant, brought this community of Albuquerque into contact with, a, with a, a, a larger world in a way that simply had not been possible before. It was, it was in the early 1880s, it was an eight-hour eight train ride from Las Vegas, uh, New Mexico to Albuquerque, in, instead of a multi-day horse and wagon um, trip. Um, this brought an enormous boost to the agricultural, I mean, to the Albuquerque economy. We had a rail yard, we had jobs, um, we had the ability to have an export and import economy. This brought significant, significant damage to the Pueblos, the railroad as it was being built through Pueblo communities. Um, you know, all six of the middle Rio Grande Pueblo communities were just devastated by the railroad. The, the, the engineers um, and construction crews didn't care about local ditches or, or arroyos. They would flood fields, they would build right through fields. Um, and it also um, sort of forced this modernity onto Pueblos that were trying to preserve sovereignty in a, in a cultural and, and landscape um, way of life. So it was an enormous benefit to a growing city, but came with significant costs. Um, but perhaps most importantly, um, it brought a city. So if you look at, at, at that map of Albuquerque and you can see the growing city um, and you can see the river coming down the west side of the valley um, and you can see where I've drawn that blue line, that's where the river wanted to go periodically. Um, and you could see where that blue line is headed right at downtown. Flooding was incredibly common. Um, and rivers don't behave in a way that is conducive to building cities adjacent to them. So if you, if you, um, you know, rivers had a lot of sediment. You've seen the Rio Grande, it's kind of muddy. And so when you would have, a, before we had levees and pinned it down in this really narrow band, spring runoff, the river would rise up out of its banks and spread out across the lowlands nearby. We drop out its sediment and slowly but surely it would build up higher and higher. And eventually it'd get really high and then the river would want to go over here. Right? And so, so on time scales of thousands of years, the river went back and forth from where it is now to where that blue line is and back. Um, with the arrival of the railroad in the San Luis Valley to our north in, in the early 1880s, farming there exploded. Um, they started irrigating a lot. There was a lot less water getting to the valley, but still a lot of sediment in it. So all of a sudden you got more and more sediment building up um, and the river um, kept rising and rising and rising out of its banks and along with it, the water table. And so where I've drawn those crazy green blobs was increasingly, um, was increasingly swampy land, swamp land, right? And you know, the, the farming here during the 1800s um, was marginal at best anyway. It was an ancillary activity to other economies. The sheep economy, the railroad economy, was folks growing food to feed themselves largely. Not much export commercial activity. Um, but now we're trying to build a city 
Um, and as the, the late Steve Reynolds, um, famous state engineer for many, many years, said, it's hard to develop economically in a swamp. And it, look at that picture, right? So um, that's a place that may be familiar to many of you. Um, Los Poblanos fields off of Montaño in the North Valley. Um, we spent some time trying to match up the mountains and we're pretty sure we've pinned down the location. And if you look at the maps from the 1920s, there's the outline of a lake there. It was shallow, right? It was, it was a lake. It's, it's hard to develop economically in a swamp. And so you saw in Albuquerque um, this movement led by um, folks in the developing urban community to drain that swamp and led by the remarkable Aldo Leopold. And we think of Aldo Leopold um, as uh, um, uh, an environmentalist, a naturalist, a forester, champion of wilderness. In that period of time, he was an extremely skilled public relations functionary for the Albuquerque Chamber of Commerce, which hired him to, among other things, lead a campaign to bring drainage to the valley. Um, uh, it began with the formation of the Rio Grande Drainage Association. And, and it's worth thinking, because we have a government agency today that does this, there was no government agency. Um, we had city governments that could barely, in fact, in 1918, they were doing a very poor job of getting the sewage out of the city. Um, they had kind of solved the drinking water problem for the city of Albuquerque, but the city of Albuquerque was just a small thing over on one side near the railroad. Um, the county government had tried and failed to do flood control. Um, and so, you know, the county government didn't have the taxation powers or the powers to build dikes and levees and drainage. Um, and so the Rio Grande Drainage Association formed to try to solve this problem. And what you see there is a map that um, the group I'm working with at the university developed, Brennan Davis, who's a, a water resources community and regional planning student, did the, did the sort of data analysis and map work for it. We got the, the membership of the Rio Grande Drainage Association and plotted where they live, right? And you see where they're all from. This was a group of downtown, mostly merchants, cobblers, um, grocery store owners, um, bankers, you know, there were some rich elites, but it was the middle class, and they were trying to build a city, and they were trying to build a city in the swamp, and they needed to drain that swamp. Um, and, and Aldo famously, he's such a great writer, it's like as a, as a writer, I just like read his work, and it's like, um, came up with, the, with their slogan, united we drain, divided we drown. And, and it became a community campaign. There's this, um, wonderful road trip where they put um, big banners on the side of a train and went up and down the Rio Grande Valley with these United We Drain, Divided We Drown, um, uh, uh, po you know, poster signs on the side of the train to attract, um, to attract attention. Um, and, and again, this was not the government doing this. This was civic leaders led by the Chamber of Commerce, um, uh, and they gave Aldo the job of helping promote this set of ideas. Aldo was sympathetic to this. He lived at, uh, in a house on 14th Street um, that backed on the swamp, right? So he had some personal knowledge. If you, if you go to his house today, which is you know, just off of the Country Club neighborhood, the, the whole street that he's on, the houses are built up off the ground a couple of feet, and they have concrete steps up, right? Because they knew they were at the edge of the floodplain. Again, the river wasn't over there. The river was everywhere. Um, so let's, let's talk about Max, because Max is a fascinating character in terms of understanding the pattern of cultural change that was underway. A um, uh, uh, member of the extended Gutierrez family, really um, important um, family in sort of politics and leadership in the, in the um, 1800s and early 1900s. Um, Max was a farmer um, and a stockman. Um, sheep, cattle. Um, he, he farmed on 25 acres, that is where um, Valley High School is today off Candelaria. I grew up in the Los Griegos, Los Candelarias neighborhood. Um, uh, I, think we, I totally think we should rename Valley High School Max Gutierrez High School. Um, I'm not getting very far with that one. Um, 
And he was a character. There, you know, he was, he was a sheriff's deputy chasing cattle rustlers. He was involved in some nefarious gunplay of his own. You know, real character. He was one of the first characters that when we got started on the book. We said, this Max guy's so interesting. We've got to figure out how to write about this guy. Um, uh, and he was elected to the county commission in 1918. He was um, leading from the perspective of the traditional Hispanic Osaki and farming communities um, in the move toward bringing those communities into this modern city growth development. He was the leader of, one of the leaders of what they called the good roads movement, right? We didn't have roads then. We had dirt, muddy ruts. Um, building roads was a critical government function. Um, uh, he was an advocate for drainage. It, it, they were trying at the level of the county commission to work on flood control, but it couldn't, couldn't make it work. Um, they didn't have the resources. They didn't have the money to do flood control. Um, and, and he became, and, 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 I, and again, I like this picture, that's Max's old neighborhood. We can, we can put Max there, standing, looking out across this landscape. Um, and so Max became one of the leaders of, um, of the push for drainage. Um, he became part of Aldo Leopold's campaign as a government official, as an elected official, as a community leader. Um, I'm gonna talk about Pablo Beta next. And again, I don't want you to think these are the only people. There, there were many Pueblo leaders, there were many Hispanic leaders, there were many civic, you know, Anglo civic leaders who were involved in this. Um, but it helps to have names and stories. Um, and Pablo was one of the most important um, Pueblo leaders during that time period. Um, uh, he was, as were many um, uh, young people of his time, educated in boarding schools that were intended to um, destroy the indigenous culture and teach um, you know, English and Spanish and English and Spanish culture. Um, this was at a time when it was believed that assimilation um, was, was the destiny of these Pueblo communities. And Pablo, Pablo Beta, like many of the leaders, and we talk about a number of them in the book, um, really wisely became um, bilingual, trilingual, both in language and culture, and went back and then used that skill set to do the opposite of what the intention was assimilation, but use, understand the interaction with the dominant culture in a way that he could use his skills to preserve um, Pueblo culture. Um, uh, Isleta on some of the best high ground above the floodplain of the river, but with farmland opposite the river, he had to take a boat to get across to the farmland. Um, Pablo Beta in 1912 obtained federal funding for what we think is the first federally funded bridge um, in the valley. Bridges, again, really important. Um, one at Isleta and the second at San Felipe. Um, uh, and um, Isleta, again, had been on this land for many centuries. Um, and there's this, this amazing testimony that he gave before a congressional panel meeting here in Albuquerque during that time period about the effect of all this change that was happening um, on his community. Change in the culture, but change in the river. Um, and I want to just quote him here. If we run short of water for irrigation, it is because of you who came are gobbling up all the water. And if we are flooded with it, it is because you who came are diking and damming the river, thereby causing the water under the ground to raise, thereby when we sow wheat, we raise alkali. All this is done or caused because of you who came, right? So Isleta was downstream of all this chaos and all the things that were happening upstream and changing the river were devastating to Pueblo communities in many ways, but, but especially to, to Isleta. And so Isleta became a leader in the steps that followed, that led toward um, what became the Conservancy District. Um, but there's a really important digression here that's necessary, and this may seem to have nothing to do with conservancy or drainage or flood control or irrigation. Um, but, but I need you to think about the broader political and cultural and legal context of the time. Because the Pueblos, in a way that is sometimes difficult for those of us not part of their culture to understand, were fighting for the very survival of their culture. Um, and they were fighting to preserve sovereignty. And that meant a couple of things. It meant sovereignty over their land and sovereignty over their water. 
and sovereignty over their cultural practices. Um, and in 1920, um, uh, uh, Charles Carter, who was a member of the Chickasaw Nation, proposed, and an, and an advocate for Native American rights, he was a United States Senator, um, uh, a reliable advocate for indigenous rights, proposed to build a grant U.S. citizenship um, to Native Americans. For Pablo um, and the other leaders of Pueblo communities um, in New Mexico, this was a gift they were not asking for. They believed that citizenship was a step on the path to assimilation and losing their own separate cultural identity that they wanted to preserve. And um, there was a resurgence at that time of um, uh, an organization that goes under, has gone under various names over, over the years, of the Al Pueblo Council, um, uh, that emerged to fight the Carter Bill. Um, and they succeeded in this, it's just really interesting to watch the politics of the day. The Pueblo um, uh, political skills in Washington and national public relations were just remarkable. And it's not like this was easy stuff and it wasn't a free pass, um, but they were extremely skilled in the national politic, playing in the national political arena. Um, and they killed the Carter Bill. Pueblo opposition, especially, along with several other tribes around the country, were essential to killing um, the, um, the Carter Bill. A um, couple of years later, Holm Bursum, New Mexico's senator, um, introduced uh, a bill, the Bursum Bill, to settle land claims and grants within Indian reservations in the state of New Mexico, which was intended to settle these hotly, deeply contested land claims between Pueblos over their land grants and um, colonizers who had, in the Pueblos, who squatted on land and the colonizers believed that they had fairly acquired this land, enormously controversial in the time. Um, again, uh, and, and Bursum's bill would have really tipped the scales toward the settlers. Um, the Pueblos again rose up, marshaled a national political campaign, um, and, um, and killed it. So what does this have to do with the Conservancy District? At the time, the conservancy district, the conservancy effort was underway, and it was clear that to do what we needed to do in the valley with flood control and drainage required integration across the landscape, across communities, both Pueblo, Hispanic, Anglo. Um, you need to bring all these communities together. And the Pueblo communities are like, we're going to be on board with this, and Pablo led this. We're going to be on board with this, but not if the Burson Bill passes, and not if the Carter Bill passes. And so if you look at that testimony that, um, that I read, um, Pablo Abeda talking about drain the need for drainage and flood control and help, that was testimony in a hearing where he was testifying against the Carter Bill. Pablo leadership was really astutely linking irrigation, drainage, and flood control, and their need, uh, and the community's need to manage that problem to their need to um, preserve sovereignty. So all of these people came together, um, and, and one of the reasons I chose in particular Aldo and Max uh, and Pablo Abeta is we can put them all in the same room at a drainage conference organized by Aldo Leopold in Albuquerque, um, uh, and the PR campaign was intense. Valley's fully aware of drainage need. Um, on the agenda, speaking at this meeting were both Max, you know, Aldo organized the meeting, Max and Pablo both spoke at the meeting. Um, and we haven't found any record of what Max actually said at that meeting. Nobody paid much attention to him. But what, what um, Pablo Beta said was incredibly important. At that meeting, Pablo, um, speaking on behalf of his letter Pueblo, but by implication the All Pueblo Council pled, pledged Pueblo support for this collective project of drainage, um, of drainage for the valley. Um, the Pueblos were on board. Um, and this was an incredibly important step forward 
in, again, remember I'm talking about the need for collective action, and collective action at a scale that went beyond any existing village or city or Pueblo, any county, any individual county, somehow needed to get everybody in the valley together on the same page to move forward. Um, and there was an additional um, hope at that time. So remember I mentioned the Reclamation Act, so this is the Federal then Reclamation Service, which became the Bureau of Reclamation, which was going around the, the West spending significant sums of federal dollars. We, in the Water Resources Program at UNM, we call it other people's money. It's like, it's great when you get other people's money to solve your water problems, you're golden, right? There was this big pile of other people's money available. Arthur Powell Davis, the commissioner of the Reclamation Service, came to um, Albuquerque in 1921 and talked enthusiastically about the, um, um, the possibilities of a big federal project. There was a major piece of federal legislation which would have both provided a huge sum of money for this work and also really importantly extended reclamation services um, responsibilities to the challenge of drainage. Um, up till that time, reclamation just did, rec did irrigation projects. We needed drainage, so we needed both money and a change to the federal law so the federal government could, um, could help us with the drainage problem. Super enthusiastic, and then, and really interestingly, in a, in a private meeting with the Albuquerque leaders, um, uh, Albuquerque leaders said, first thing you need to do is form a drainage district. And, and I want to step back and explain drainage, because it may, you know, you know, the water nerds, we think about drainage all the time, we understand what it is, but if you're, if you're out across the valley um, and you see these big, low ditches, often with very little water in them, um, that's how we drain those swamps. You dig a, a low ditch through the valley, and there's one, like I can, there's a drain right, right beyond the fence there, um, lowers, the water, lowers the water table. Um, this is the, the Griegos, this is the one that drained that swamp by, uh, by Max's house. Um, um, the first step is to form a drainage district. You need a local government entity to partner with the federal government to carry out um, the task of drainage. Um, you know, that was, the, um, that was the critical thing. So there's all this federal money, um, and people were moving fast at that point. Um, March of 1923, the legislature passed the Conservancy Act, as Stephanie mentioned. Um, uh, in September, the Rio, Rio Grande Valley Reclamation Association, sort of a descendant of the drainage association that I showed you that map of, um, so 100 years ago this month, filed a petition for the creation of what would become the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District. There's something else really important happening in 1923 that gets sort of less historical attention. Isleta wasn't waiting. Um, uh, Isleta, working with the Indian Irrigation System, um, was already building a project, drainage, irrigation system management for Isleta lands, that w were in fact the first construction of ditches of what would become the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District. So in late uh, 1923, 100 years ago, this, this fall, and into 1924, in 1924, the first ditches of what would become the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District were being dug, and it was by um, the federal government and Isleta Pueblo in partnership. Like, that's where the actual district construction first began. Um, um, we're talking about the 100th anniversary of the Conservancy um, Act. We have you know, much more story to tell in the years to come as we think about how we commemorate the 100th anniversary of um, the Middle Rio Grande, what finally became the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District, right? And you see the, the logo, and I love the logo because it's the river, right? It's the river flowing through a dry desert valley. Like, that's what this is about. Um, uh, the federal funding we were going after um, evaporated, um, the, it lost its legislative supporters, the federal funding died, um, the, the juggernaut of a conservancy district um, uh, chugged along um, despite it. The conservancy district 
as we know it was formed in 1925. Um, the legislature almost killed it more than once in the 1920s. Um, finally got its approval in the late 1920s. Really importantly, with the support of the All Pueblo Council and because the federal funding for the project as a whole had evaporated and they were having a very difficult time selling the bonds based on the idea that we were gonna pay for it ourselves. Um, Pueblo support was critical because uh, money from the Indian Irrigation System uh, Service appropriated by Congress, right? This is, for those of you in the water nerds, the prior and paramount lands, the irrigation of those lands. That was the seed money that provided the down payment for us to um, begin real construction of what ultimately we'd become um, the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District. And, and this is a really important piece of the story, right? It was civic leaders in urban Albuquerque, largely Anglo, but not entirely. It was old village folks like Max Gutierrez moving toward modernity, again, largely Hispanic, but not entirely. And it was the Pueblo communities at that time, you know, all these communities' attitudes toward the district and the river have evolved over time, but it was that Pueblo money provided the critical down payment um, that allowed the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District to form. And then Max, and this is why Max is famous character, right? I, I, you know, I left this part of the story out. Max switched, Max became a strong opponent of the formation of the Conservancy District. Um, he led a farmer's coalition that sued to block it because the financing mechanism that they landed on would have, he felt, unjustly um, and inappropriately taxed the farmers themselves in ways that they wouldn't, weren't going to be able to afford. So Max became this really important political leader in opposition to the thing um, that, that he had once tried to form, taking his case all the way um, to, um, to the United States um, Supreme Court. Um, 1930, um, the first Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District ditches, other than the Isleta ones, were dug. Um, this amazing moment where we dug drains up and down along paralleling the rivers, threw up the dirt into levees that disconnected the river from the community. The menace was the first step toward taming the menace, right? The levees didn't work all that well. Um, it's taken some time to improve them. Um, all, all, that, all that happened. Um, and, and so it's, it's really important to remember that what we have here is three different cultural trends meeting and converging around a river valley, um, succeeding through collaboration, often through confrontation and conflict in ultimately building um, the institutional infrastructure um, that has made it possible for a modern city to be built on the floor of the Rio Grande um, Valley. Um, and, and so the Conservancy Act I view as the central piece in uh, a history of what made Albuquerque, uh, what made it possible for Albuquerque uh, to be the city it is today. So thank you, and I think maybe we got some time for some questions. This may be a really dumb question, but given that the river moved and there was swampland right next to the river, why would they put the city there? Why didn't they move it over? So they wouldn't have to deal with all those problems. Um, that's, in, in hindsight, that's an excellent question. And it actually doesn't have an easy answer. But um, the, the railroad built along the margin of the valley floor um, up high enough that they were largely out of the floodplain, although actually, actually right down here was a place they were particularly vulnerable to flooding. They need, need, needed to build a rail yard. There was a lot of cheap land available where downtown is today was just kind of a swamp. The land was cheap. Um, and they weren't really thinking it through. Um, and uh, they weren't thinking it through. Yeah. They, they, they pretty quickly started building up onto the mesas, but we didn't have roads, paved roads. And they, yeah, they, they, they built where they had already been. I'm really looking forward to your book. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. I thought I saw a hand over here.
Good afternoon, this is really fun to see. Um, my name is Julie Radoslovich, and I grew up in the South Valley, and I just had to say, I was laughing because the drainage ditch, we always thought as kids, that's just where all the crawdads were. We didn't think it had actual real function, so it was really fun to understand better the drainage ditch versus the Aztecki as they have a use, so thank you. Yeah, yeah, and the, the, the South Valley, there, there, was, um, there were a bunch of lakes over there, like, like where, where um, uh, the Anderson Farms is, the old tobacco farms, that, that was a lake, <laughs> that was a swamp. Uh, uh, back in the day, there was like a hunting club. We have a great picture drawn by Aldo Leopold of him hunting geese, he drew a picture of geese he was hunting there. So. John, I'm sure it's complicated, but can you just tell us a little bit about what else is gonna be in the book? Are you gonna talk about how all the acequias were brought in and, and future? Um, changes in the Bosque, for example. And yeah, tell so... Us, tell us the table of contents. Yeah, so, so um, um, we, we have a, a big discussion of bridges, because bridges are the thing we take for granted. But they're really important um, in, in how you build a city on a river. Um, the story of bridges in, in, um, in river cities is always fascinating. So we have the story of how we got all these bridges, um, you know, all the way up to the, the remarkable Montano Bridge fight of the... Um, uh, 80s and 90s. Um, we have a story about the evolution of parks in open space and the notion um, that the river, rather than a menace, could be a sort of aesthetic and recreational um, amenity for the community. Aldo Leopold, again, played a really important role. Um, uh, Rio Grande Park, the city park, um, the ball fields, the zoo, um, the, the Rio Grande Park, what used to be called Carson Park, that's all a project that Aldo really led. Um, he was a real strong advocate for, for parks and that changing attitude. Um, we talk about the arrival of the Bureau of Reclamation in the 50s, taking over the project, channel realignment, really the narrowing of the river in a way that enabled the creation of the Bosque we so much love today and think of as like this great natural amenity, and, and I love it as a natural amenity, kind of a creation of river management across the um, uh, the 20th century, and we talk about the interaction between the evolution of urban communities and the old um, irrigation landscape, a, an enormously important political fight in the South Valley in the 1970s when kids were falling in ditches and drowning, um, and there was a real strong push to try to do something about that. You still see some of the old fences along the Arnold Canal today um, in that way. We, we talk a lot about, we have a long discussion of um, the construction of Cochiti Dam and the damage to Cochiti Pueblo and broader uh, Pueblo cultural values um, associated with that and that sort of uneasy, complicated relationship between Pueblo communities um, and the dominant culture trying to run trains and highways and irrigation ditches through the midst of these time immemorial cultures. Yeah. So, so, John, this is Chuck Dumars. Hey, right Chuck. Over here. <laughs> I'll stand up. Oh, there. Okay. Hey, Chuck. Yeah. I, I had a question for you. Why do you think that the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District, what are the components uh, that caused the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District for the, to exist for the last hundred years? Um, so, we built it at a time when we really needed it. Um, if we wanted to build a city. Um, and then we had it, and we kept having to tweak it and adapt it because it worked pretty poorly in many ways for a long time. Um, and, and what allowed it to endure was this sort of tension of conflict and collaboration um, and adaptation. And if you look at the Conservancy District today, it's a very different government entity. Because I remember government agencies are, again, tools that we make. And so if the tool's not doing the job right, we adapt the tool. So f enormous changes in the taxation structure and the financing structure over time, um, a dramatic shift um, away from a, an appointed board of experts to an elected board and the, um, and the introduction of sort of democratic uh, governance. Um, and it, it's a willingness of the community to say, you know, it's not working the way it is, we need to change it, and those changes were always um, complex and difficult, but um, it's a testament to the adaptive capacity of human communities in the face of change, right? That's why I'm so optimistic more broadly about our ability to solve these really thorny water challenges. It's like, 
we adapt and we've seen this happen. And so you end up with this fascinating little institutional widget um, of the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy's district today that's now, you know, without really being able to claim it as a primary mission, providing enormous recreational benefits, um, that's providing irrigation water, that still quietly provides the drainage and flood control that it was originally formed. So as our views of it evolved, and, and you yourself were involved, involved in a lot of those periods of change in the last 30 years, um, uh, our adaptive capacity is fully on display when you look at the evolution of the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District. Hi, I'm Teresa Smith-Desharif with the Valencia Soil and Water Conservation District Board. Uh, our district serves uh, the Pueblo of Isleta, the Pueblo of Laguna, all of Valencia County, and a small strip of uh, northern Socorro County. And I just want to thank you very much for highlighting the vital and visionary role of the Pueblo of Isleta in, in bringing all of us together all these years later and, and really bringing this possibility forward 100 years ago and more. Um, and I hope the MRGCD can do some more public education on that. I think it would be wonderful to see it in the schools. Thank you very much. Th thanks. Uh, I'm David Montoya uh, uh, from the North Valley. But I wonder, because we're still dewatering, do we end up losing that water to Texas because we are dewatering still? because that adds to the water that goes into the river and therefore they, uh, they have you know, rights to it. I just, it may be unrelated to your subject anyway. You know, there's people in this room smarter than I am about this, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna punt on that question. I, I, I mean, it, one of the, let me dodge the question in a useful way. <laughs> um, one of the really important things in our book but more broadly in the work that we do in the Water Resources Program, the Department of Economics and Water Policy, is to try to get people to um, think more broadly about what we mean when we say the river. Because we've pinned part of the river between these levees. But the drains are part of the river too, and the irrigation ditches spreading water out across a landscape um, um, that, that um, the river used to flow out across on its own. And so I think of what's in the drain as part of the river as well, right? And that, you know, the, the water accounting is a complicated problem, and I don't want to begin to, to say that. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's any more water or less water to Texas. Um, that's my um, slightly ignorant but maybe a little bit informed answer. But, but it suggests this broader question of the separation of the river being the part just beyond that levee that I can see. It's so cool that I got to give this talk like looking at the Bosque and the levee. Um, uh, the drain on this side is part of the river too. So. Um, yeah, I have a question just about this whole formation, formation of the drainage of the swamp of this area mm -hmm. and what effect did that have on the whole ecosystem of the area? Oh, you this, know? Is great, this is a great um, question. I don't know if that's in yeah. your book, but just oh, yeah, yeah. taking all the species that must have lived here yeah, yeah. and all the ecosystem and yeah. just these famous They're, conservationists who just drain this area yeah. um, there, to, so we can live here. There's this, there's this marvelous master's thesis by a University of New Mexico biologist named Marjorie Van Cleve, which we highlight as much as we possibly could. She's amazing. 1935, she did a survey of the ecosystem changes as a result of the, um, the drainage in an instant, you know, in, within a year, we drained, lowered the water table, and you had all these magnificent, there's a really interesting distinction, we, linguistic distinction. You know, I've talked about draining the swamp, that's what we would today call a wetland. Wetland's a good thing, we wanted to provide ecosystem goods and services and benefits and birds and it's a natural system. Um, today's wetland was yesterday's swamp, and Van Cleve did an amazing job of documenting the rapid decline of these wetlands and the birds and the sedges and marsh grasses. Um, it was an ecosystem absolutely destroyed. Um, and the people at the time were fine because like, that's useless to me, I want to put a farm there. So, yeah, really important question, thanks. This will be our last question. 
No, the pressure's on. I didn't actually really have a question. John, I wanted to thank you for the talk and raising the awareness of the history of the Middle Rio Grand Conservancy District. It is a great history. Um, I wanted to acknowledge the leadership of the Board of Directors of the Middle Rio Grand Conservancy District for having the vision to, to celebrate this 100-year anniversary of the Conservancy Act and, and the leadership of J.C. Kasuga as the director there. Um, but I also just wanted to make a quick comment about Conservancy Districts. Reclamation works with a lot of irrigation districts, and some of them are not prepared for the future because they only have the one mission of irrigation. The Conservancy Districts have a, a broader mission and therefore a, a broader tax base, and they're much more prepared for the changes in the climate and the, the changes in the ridification that's coming at us. So I'm um, just glad to be here to help celebrate the, the Conservancy Act that the, the state had the, the vision and just a, a great story. So thanks to everybody. Thank, thank you all. So good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Jason Kasuga, and I'm the CEO and Chief Engineer for the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District. And um, one, again, I think we should all say thank you to John. I think there's a lot more to come. And I also think the history of this valley and what's going on is super important as we ask questions about uh, the infrastructure that we have, um, the agriculture that we have, that the ecosystem that we enjoy, because an ecosystem was destroyed, uh, but another ecosystem was made. Uh, and so I think these are good questions to ask as we look forward to the future, and I look forward to um, John's book. And so one more round of applause for John, please. So one of the things I think that is really important for us to do is capture moments like these, because obviously this is a great room full of um, many people that I do work with and that the district does work with every day. Uh, but I also know there's not a lot of people who are able to uh, attend this. Obviously, the valley is much larger than this room. So uh, as you can see, this event is being recorded. Um, this talk is being recorded. And this will be posted on the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District's website under the history section. And we will be also making the, uh, the video available to uh, John Fleck um, for use at UNM. Uh, so there will be a way for, fee for folks to access this material um, going forward. Uh, one of the things I also want to just uh, end on is on, on behalf of the staff and the board of directors, we do want to say thank you for being here. Um, it's important um, that we have collaboration and that we talk about our, our history and we talk about our future and that can't be done without um, constituents, uh, partnering agencies, um, our consultants, uh, and all the different NGOs and, and friends that we have. So again, thank you for being here. Uh, there are, uh, well, John talked about this is, this is not the celebration and or the acknowledgement of a 100-year anniversary of the MRGCD. Uh, that's to come. And so this event is really an introductory as we prepare and get ready over the next two years to prepare for the 100-year centennial of the Conservancy District. And so um, this is kind of a, a little introductory to that because uh, this, this will be something that we celebrate through the valley um, and acknowledge through the valley um, all the way down from our southern end to our northern end. Uh, I think the uh, acknowledging the impact um, to Pueblos and to all the communities, uh, but then also acknowledging who we are as a district today and, and the work that we're doing uh, in all of these communities. So please look forward to that, uh, that, that you will see more um, being published in, in our webpage uh, about that. And then as you guys saw, there's, uh, there are photos, historical photos, which I think are really good to go with um, a lot of John's talk, especially when we talk about this idea of what the river was doing to the valley. Uh, while we as people wanted to gather along this valley and, and build community. And I think those are um, great pictures uh, to, uh, to be able to take a look at. And we'll also have those available um, for you to be able to look at online if you guys want access to them um, and not just, not just the prints. And the uh, final thing is, um, can the board of directors uh, and staff please stick around um, for photos? After we're done, uh, we would like to, to capture this moment and, and get some photography uh, of our event today. And so um, ending, I just wanna say again, on behalf of the board of directors and the staff, thank you so much. Um, John, thank you. Uh, I know we have some other folks in the room uh, and I wanna just say thank you to you all. I wish I could acknowledge everybody, um, but uh, uh, thank you, thank you so much. Um, this has been a great event and we appreciate you being here. Thank you.